It's the Pikey and Lout Show, Talking Taipans. Chris Pike and Alex Loughton come to you with everything that is 100% Taipans. Let's go. It's Talking Taipans. Hello and welcome to our second edition of 2021 of the Pikey and Lout Show. We're talking Taipans and we've got... Two big games to review already on the on the show from last week, round one in the NBL. And we've got two more to look forward to in Cairns this coming weekend. So there's no time to, to waste here on the Pikey and Lau show. Let's get straight into it. I'm Chris Pike, your co-host, joined by one of the all-time greats of the Cairns Taipans. A pleasure to be joined by him once again, Alex Loughton. How do I find you this evening? Hey, g'day, Pikey. No, very good, mate, and uh, excited uh, for this uh, next round. But, of course, yeah, two two big games, uh, very different games to uh, review mm. in such close succession. So uh, let, let's get into it. Yeah, let's get straight into it. There was plenty to talk about. So, first of all, Saturday night, obviously not at the convention centre, so all the games this season played at the Cairns Pop-Up Arena, and the Taipans got the win 87 to 86 over the Sydney Kings. Short turnaround then to Monday night. And it was a loss to the Hawks, unfortunately, 92-76. to 76. And now, um, this weekend, Saturday night, it's against the Kings once again. And then, Monday night, it's Melbourne United. So, four games in the space of nine days. The Taipans are currently 1-1. One and one. What did you make of the opening weekend? And then we'll, we'll dissect the games in a bit more detail shortly. Well, it was a massive week uh, emotionally leading up for this weekend. And, um, mm. you know, we, we, we knew that was the, the case that, you know, it would weigh heavily on the on the squad. But, you know, they came through uh, in, you know, right in the, in the nick of time. And and uh, really, it was, a, it was a big win for, uh, for Ross. Um, and it was a great thing for the club just to be able to rally, uh, you know, and, and really get the win for, for Ross and, uh, you know, a huge part of the club. So it was such an emotionally draining week for the, for the guys I know and the coaching staff and obviously the, the club. Um, so it was just a big sort of a, a tribute win. Uh, and from then they, they announced um, uh, they will tribute all of, of the home wins uh, in honour of Ross Moller and LJ Hooker, his business. So it's a, it's a real fitting uh, tribute for the club to, to be able to bestow that on all home wins uh, for the rest of the season. Yeah, that's fantastic news. We were, I guess, we were lucky enough to play a small part on last week's show and dedicating our show to to Ross Moller and his memory. And it's great that the, that the Taipans are embracing it so much and, and and paying tribute to somebody that, as we talked about last week, meant so much to the club. So it, it's obviously a, a horrible situation that we're in, but it's nice that he's now going to be have an ongoing going legacy as well. Yeah, absolutely. This episode of the Pikey and Lowes Show is proudly brought to you by Cairns Total Physio. Less pain, more life. And Statton's Plumbing Company. Plumbers who care. And for, for the lads on the floor, um, some big contributions from some very well-known names in that first game. Uh, Machado starting in very good fashion with eight assists. He was looking pretty solid. And uh, obviously, Oliver, yep. it's six blocks, I believe, just set the tone defensively the starters proved very strong we, we thought they were going to start with Jerick um Jer- Jerick or Kenny and uh Jerick was certainly mm-hmm. uh, I thought he was the difference maker for this uh opening game he really he really uh lit a fire under the camp and just brought everything that we we saw of him last year in those stages where he would light up and fire up um he brought that from game one which was a real positive sign and he was able to connect i thought he was the difference in this game to be perfectly honest with you i thought drive and his uh fire really got the tie pants going almost out of a bit of a, a bit of a slumber because they weren't leading for uh, much of the game and it really was until the final sort of stage is able to, to get over the line, but definitely uh, credit to, to Jarek on how he handled, especially that start of that game. Yeah, he came up huge and he shot the ball tremendously, went four of seven from, from three-point land. And Kuat Noy as well, he didn't miss one of his three three-point attempts as well. So that was that was important, especially when Machado and Oliver didn't have great, great shooting nights. So it was important for those guys to step up. But the impressive thing was to me was that, like you said, the Kings were on top for most of the game, but... The Taipans just hung in there, and then they were able to to turn things around. And you just always had a feeling that they would make a run. It was kind of led by Cam Oliver defensively. He didn't have a huge game offensively, 12 points, 3 of 10. But six blocks, like you said, and some of those blocks were were massively important. Down low, and, and really, the he, he played like a man defensively, which is what he needs to do without DJ Newbill there to 
play the perimeter defense he did last year. Cam has to step up and defensively, I thought he was, he was huge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he got the double-double, uh, six blocks, 10 rebounds, 12, 12 points. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, and this will come up during the season many times. Okay, so the, the scoring punch off the bench is going to be crucial for the Taipans this year. Got now, what, what was your formula? How, much, how many points did you want off the bench last year? Oh, you, you, I, I feel you need 25 uh, to yep. 30 points off the bench consistently, especially down in, in post-season play. Uh, you want the that bench really humming and just providing so much punch. What I can see here, 18 points off the bench, which yep. was solid. I don't think it was quite where the contributions need to be, but they also perhaps didn't have the, the time. They did very well for the, the, the minutes that they got at the bench, but it was it was very starters uh, heavy in terms yeah, of the rotation. No, no, nobody off the bench uh, With so many than, games... More than, yeah, 15 minutes. 14 minutes. Chris so Levin, 15, yeah. 50, so fab. When you've got so many games packed in, back to back to back to back, a, a little niggle of a starter, you know, he's going to be sort of uh, pushing... Pushing that load uphill is wearing something. If you've got the bench that can really supplement uh, and bring big contributions, then you can rest the, the starters a little bit more or just manage the minutes better. Um, and I think that probably carried over into the second game where it was even uh, more starter heavy in terms of the rotation. So 18 points in this first outing from, from the bench uh, and obviously got the win, which is great. And then, uh, mm. in you know, we'll just talk about that second game in a moment. But Sydney Kings, I, I, I thought they played really well. I thought they, they looked very well drilled. I thought Adam Ford, at, you know, new new head coach, I, I thought he, he mixed up the uh, out of bounds and sideline plays. He kind of ran a whole bunch of tricks and backdoor yeah. plays and stuff that you probably normally save for the end of the season. You know, you, you have all those, those one-trick pony type plays up your sleeve for that moment. Like Trevor Gleeson would always do that at the Wildcats and I think he mm. would have got a lot of his um, uh, plays from, from Gleeson at the Wildcats days. But um, I, th I thought he handled game one pretty solid. Your thoughts on a uh, new coach for the Sydney Kings? Yeah, I thought he did a good job. He's been a really well-thought-of th well assistant coach for a long time, firstly, at the Wildcats. And then... For a lot of the time at the Kings last year, especially in the preseason when Will Weaver was away with the Boomers, he was coaching that Sydney team throughout the whole preseason. Right. So he, he right. was really well thought of there. So he was a natural fit to step up to be the, be the head coach. And yeah, I thought he handled himself well. What I did like was that some new faces at the Kings, DJ Vasilovic, their rookie, I thought he stepped up and had a, had a tremendous game. There's been a, so much talk coming into this season about the next stars, Mojave King and Josh Giddy, um, and even Justinian Jessup at the Hawks. But... I thought I thought Vasilovic showed that he's, you know, not too far off the mark with with those sort of guys as well. Based on on his his debut, Casper Ware, fascinating to get your thoughts on on him. He he really struggled shooting, pretty much all of last season, and that was highlighted once the Kings got to the to the grand final. He started pretty well, I thought, on Saturday when he was trying to get to his mid range game, and he made some shots, but he ended up settling back for the for the three ball. Ended up going six of twenty one for the night. One of nine from three, including taking the shot at the end, a three-point shot, contested shot for, for the game, which missed. Um, I'll ask you about the foul that wasn't a shooting foul in a minute, but firstly, just get, wanted to get your thoughts on on Casper Ware and, and probably his matchup with Machado. Well, I mean, 18 points is no um, sort of uh, slouch, but yeah, yeah. That, that shooting percentage, that's the, the realms of last season's uh, not-so-great performance, I guess, that 20%. So uh, actually, sorry, it might have even been less than that just sort of the ghosts of last year kind of still in play for Casper I mean you you'd you know that he's a superstar and he'll he'll figure it out but um yeah he, he obviously wasn't on song from beyond beyond the arc but he certainly was very effective throughout the game um but yeah d during the course of a season how much longer uh, would the Sydney Kings be prepared for this to go on? I mean, he, he's, he's locked in for the season, don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, after that, they, they might be looking at it going, well, just not quite getting it done. But we'll see during the season where he, he's shifted gears before, but he's certainly trying mm. to lock back into that 2018 championship performance with Melbourne United. Um, but, yeah, we just haven't seen him return to that form, and certainly not last year. Uh, by the end of the year, I, th I thought I thought the Sydney Kings, they were yep. minor premiers, and they, they got there by by committee. I thought they had a lot of solid contributors, and it might have even masked the fact 
fact that Casper yeah. Ware's shooting percentages weren't that great. And then in the finals, um, you know, he was quite low 20% for, you know, especially from beyond the arc. So, yeah, he, he's just got to be able to lock back into that fine form and we're sort of yet to see that just yet but yeah you're right the, the young young guys played well Jarrell Martin I mean he he didn't start right so you know what was going uh, on there Andy only played 15 minutes, and he played 15 minutes. so what I'm hearing is that the um, strength and conditioning around sort of Sydney Kings they really take their load management very seriously um and mm. yeah he, he was on restricted minutes so he was yeah. on restricted minutes um because of the the load management that they've calculated and the algorithms that they're using um they said look he's if we don't manage the load then you know there could be injuries sooner than we want or um you know he could go down with an overuse thing mm. um so it must be frustrating in a way for first year coach to be told, look, you're not going to play your superstar, that could have changed the win. Like he he played yeah. unbelievable. He was taking the ball off the dribble. He was crossing over the bigs, going down the lane. He was he's great. Jarrell Martin is great. He's a good matchup for Oliver too. Yeah, and he's got the height advantage. Um, if if he was allowed yeah. to play another ten minutes, it could have been a different story. But um, yeah, load management at game one, um, game mm-hmm. on the line, wins hard to come by. Um, your thoughts on that? It was, their, it was their only game for the week too, which is which is strange. Yeah, the, the next game was was the week later against the same team, so, so no, no no travel to factor in. So yeah, it was. It was yeah, very I thought I thought Lazada looked looked fairly confident, um, but I mean for twenty five minutes got got seven points. Um, I, I thought he looked like a just more confident self than than a year before i think i think a year in the league does yep. that so he, he'd be one to watch this i think his english is a little bit better he seems to understand a lot more that's going on around right him. right but you're right <laughs> uh, yeah Vesseljevic. um I, I thought he certainly certainly played with confidence so they they mm. played they played really well like they hit, hit a lot of backdoor um plays during the the course of the half court game and really surprised the type ends that the, the communication defensively for the type ends at times seemed um, just a bit disconnected. They weren't. I think they're still trying to um, get on the same page. Uh, and with only two preseason games, it's hard to mm. do that. But like I said, wins are so crucial at the start, and to for the Taipans to win by one point, mm-hmm. uh, I, I hope it's a bit of a warning sign uh, at the time. I mean, there was a, a twenty point loss in the preseason. That should have been a big wake up call. A one point win isn't convincing. It was a huge win for them. Uh, but then. You know, three days or two days later, a mm. loss by 20 really, really is a big wake up call for the guys to really lock in and say, look, are we serious about this? And what do we have to do to, to raise it up a notch uh, defensively? Because there's just a, a few too many holes in that in that defense um, for that second game for sure. But look. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll get to that sure. in a second. One more thing about the, the Kings game. Now, it was a controversial finish. So, Casper yeah. Ware was run, running down the clock with Machado guarding him. Um, Machado got his hands on on Casper. I think there's no doubt it was a foul. The only question was, was it a shooting foul or not? So, it went to the video review in the, in the oh, I guess they're calling it the bunker. Um, yeah. If we take, in, take the NRL terminology. And it looked like Casper was still, hadn't risen up to take the shot yet. Yeah. So, it was called a non-shooting foul. They took the side ball. They got the ball inbounds again. And then Casper took that desperation three, which didn't fall. Now... I probably yeah. think they got the call right, but I understand that I could I could understand if the call went the other way as well. Now, before I get your thoughts, have a listen to what Adam Ford had to say about it post match. And of course, this audio brought to you courtesy of the NBL. Um, with that being said, um, it is interesting. I would like to um, further study that possession with Casper and find out what he could have done differently. Um, I feel like if that's a call halfway through the third, it's two shots. My experience would suggest that. But, look, you know, it is what it is. I'm not harping on it. It was just, it was an interesting call. Um, I know they talked, they reviewed it. So, you know, they've got their reasons. But I would probably need to be myself uh, further educated in that area to tell the difference between what is in the act of shooting and what stays on the ground. So, uh, he made his thoughts pretty clear. What were your thoughts? Uh, well, there's two images that came up on the socials afterwards. Uh, one is uh, one hand of Machado 
on uh, Casper Ware's hip as he's shooting, mm -hmm. and it's paused. Oh, that, that's the still shot. That's the frame that the um, that Coach Ford said. Look, is this? Is, this looks like a shooting foul to me. Mm -hmm. um, the referees have come back and said, "Well, here's the other still shot of two hands on the hip from Machado on Casper while he's still mm -hmm. dribbling." So here's what I think's happened: is the refs are, is blown a late whistle. And the late whistle for the two hands on the hip has happened at the point of the shot or after the shot, to which the confusion at the, in, in real time is that the shot goes up, then there's a whistle. So you think, okay, that mm -hmm. was the whistle for the shot. And then he's caught it on the ground. So the, I, I think the referee's called a late whistle um, in his mind has said, that was the foul yeah. with that two hands on, you can't check. You can't check the, the player. That's a foul. Um, but in in the the speed of the game, it's looked like he's called the the whistle straight away after the the shooting the shooting foul in the act of shooting. So um, it, the, mm -hmm. even the even the NBL ref said, "Look, this is a tough one." I I think if if that is right, that the referee was intending to call that two hands on. Um, on the on the hip of Casper Ware when he was dribbling, which is that second still frame, um, then you know I think that's a fair call. I mean, but I also think that Coach Ford might be in his yeah. right to say, "Hey, look, I it seemed like he was shooting, and here's the still shot of the the you know the foul. So yeah. what's what's going on?" And he's, <laughs> he's pretty art articulate, saying, "You know, I, I need to be better educated." He's yeah. he's not saying you made the wrong call. He's, he's actually quite <laughs> cagey with that. So I, I I kind of I kind of like the cut of his jib a bit. Um, so yeah, you, your thoughts on that one? Foul or no foul, or a shooting foul or non-shooting foul? I think you summed it up really well. I think there was two fouls there. I think the first foul was when. Casper still was dribbling the ball and hadn't hadn't risen up yet, and then as he was in the shooting motion, he was fouled again. So I think I think you're right. I think they did call that first foul. There was just a, the whistle came probably I don't know a quarter of a second late, and then that's what sort of made the confusion. And and I think Adam's also right that a lot of the time that will be called a shooting foul, probably especially if it's earlier in the game. And it's, it's a really tough one to call. I think either decision would have been the right decision, but I'm. I'm happy with the decision they made just because I think um, there was enough evidence there to suggest that he was he still hadn't gone up in the shooting motion when when Scott had his two hands on him. So that, that's, that's what I felt at the time. Yeah. And mm. just, just interestingly, um, you know, as, as we kind of move move through this, just the, the strength of the, the Kings. So 45 points, I guess, off the bench now, not... It's not quite accurate. Jarrell Martin's coming off the bench for 11. Mm. But Jordan Hunter started and he had yep. nine. Um, you know, so just it, that, that, like I said, the, that strength or, or doing it by committee is what the Kings are probably going to be about again this season. Um, you know, just a strong bench coming in as the as the starting lineup. So, I mean, they're, they're a bit of a danger team, to be honest, um, with the, with that spread. And like you said, yeah, Vissel Javich with uh, 15 uh, for the game that's 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 pretty impressive um but yeah the in the end the end result obviously king's not to be and they've got to lick their wounds and and reload a week later so um you know they'll be they'll be hungry for a bit of retribution while the the taipans are licking their wounds off two two games and some heavy minutes mm. for the starters yeah it's going to be fascinating that that response from both teams on on saturday night now because the taipans are they have to be hungry to bounce back from Monday night. So let's get to Monday night now against the Hawks. So yep. I think I think Cairns, pro coming into the game, I felt like they shook off some of those cobwebs from from the first game, and they should have been should have been firing by Monday night. But they got off to a slow start, gave up thirty one points in the first quarter, and you know there was a couple of times in the second half where they they threatened to come back. Majuk Deng caught fire a couple of different times, and and got them close. I think they got within five or six points a couple of different times, but they just never, it just never felt like it was actually going to happen. And in the end, um, some of the some of the defensive plays from from the Hawks led by led by Tyler Harvey, including that block on block on Deng where he blocked his three point shot, went down the other end and scored. That pretty much sealed the game, and that summed up the game. The Hawks just played with greater energy. They won on the loose balls. They won the possession game, and unfortunately, from a Taipans point of view, it looked like. The Hawks wanted wanted it a bit more. 
Yeah, I, I I agree. I think um I think those the loose ball. I just remember watching and going, gee, we're not coming up with mm. the loose balls. Um, you know, the, those effort areas are are going to be huge. Um, one thing I did notice, obviously, Gorgian, um, you know, often publicised as you know that that kind of Wayne mm. Bennett of the basketball world. Like he, he is a super coach. Like he's he's uh he's got a brain uh on him and he's and he's certainly played in the best leagues and international play all around the world so he's got a big bag of tricks and what he's been able to do with the hawks in such a short period of time is one giving them a, a thousand mm-hmm. different defenses he he switched it up to the zone within the first 4 minutes of the game so he's he's already making his chess moves and just trying to stifle the the uh, flow of the game. And I think it worked because it forced the type ends into, um, you know, a, a large amount of three-point shots and with, with at the expense of getting inside touches. So, you know, the number of threes um, for the type ends, uh, I've got 28, uh, 28 yeah. here. Oh, sorry, 30, 39 threes, 39 mm-hmm. threes for the game. Um, was it was a huge amount I mean they they shot 21 threes uh, but I thought they they were able to get in the paint a lot more so when when Gorgian goes to the zone the first thing that you're trying to do is get uh, ball penetration into the paint so either with a pass or a dribble and um, I I think a lot of the times the type ends settle for the three ball and they just weren't dropping so you know you've got to have a good balance when that happens and then um you know, Gorgian would would mix up the defenses again and and keep rotating in guys. But they do have the Hawks do have some mm. some great energy players, and you know, Justinian Jessup was yeah. um, a, a big big factor in that that game. He just plays with a lot of confidence and and hit a whole bunch of three balls and um, just looked pretty solid. Doesn't look like a, a first year player as a, as the next star. No. So um, you know, I, I think the Hawks are going to be the danger yeah. team now. Did we predict that in round? One, I, I did remember hesitating there thinking, gee, the Hawks with Gorge are like, I don't know, like you just can't, uh, you, you just can't underestimate them. But for the, yeah. for the type ends, I think that, you know, they were playing their second, second game, well, just like the Hawks were, the Hawks had to travel even. Um, but, you know, th- th- this has to be the wake up call where they got to get their defensive communication on point and start to get those rotations right. So on the middle on ball, the Hawks were sending their shooters to the corners. So the help guy on a pick and roll situation is usually the corner man's help as the the big is rolling down. So uh, at the at the point of the on ball, the the big defender would hard show and then recover onto the big uh, rolling down towards the basket. Well, the help man mm. is the guy who's guarding the guy in the corner. For the Hawks, that was Justinian Jessup, guys that just hit one or two threes. So one, the the uh, the Taipans defending the corner shooter were like, well, I've, I've got to kind of stay connected to the shooter in the corner, but it meant there was no help for the big rolling down the center of the keyway. So um, it really put the Taipans in a bit of a spin defensively. Am I, mm. am I staying and helping uh, the the on ball situation and the the big rolling out, or am I going to be connected to a guy that's hit hit two or three already? So it just um, yeah, it it just put them on the back foot a bit, and uh, the, they've got to be able to hammer in the, these communications a, a lot sooner and solutions a lot a lot quicker if they're going to be able to um, you know make make an impact on these first few games at home. One thing that stood out to me now, if you have a look at the box score, and it doesn't look like. AJ Ogilvy had a massive impact for the Hawks. You know, he only had six points and seven rebounds. But one stat that stands out to me is that they were plus 26 when he was on the court. Now, if I have a look up at the Taipans, Nate Jarwai played a minute 45 for the game. So I'm thinking that everything was running smoothly when AJ was on the court for the Hawks. He was facilit- facilitating the other players to be efficient and he was able to play his role defensively. Now, if I'm thinking back, he, he has a terrible time trying to defend Nate Jawai, and he might have had a much tougher night if Nate played a little bit a little bit more and it might have he might not have had a plus 26 because he might have struggled if he had to defend Jawai a little bit more am I at all on the money or, or why do you think Nate only played less than two minutes well I mean like I said that the starters were in heavy rotation uh, well there wasn't much rotation, I should say. That so the starters played heavy minutes and were backing up from from game one. Um, you know, while you're searching for answers, yeah, I mean, may, maybe it is a point where you um, you know roll the big fella out there to to 
try and mix things up as well, and maybe that that offensive impact um, can can get some of that that passing penetration at least to the keyway, and then from there he can be a facilitator. So uh, it's certainly it's certainly an option that that you'd like to see you know happen, so that you can say at the end of the game, okay, well it wasn't Jawa's fifteen minutes. Um, because we we saw what would happen, like it was, it was a minute forty five, so it's hard to really say where you know whether there would have been an impact or not. So you you know you kind of want to be able to look at the game at the end and and be able to review it like that. Um, but you know that's not meant that's that wasn't to be. And maybe uh, Coach Kelly saw the speed of the game and all the changes and everything. He didn't feel comfortable. Uh, with the pace of the game and what was happening, you know, there was a lot of like those on balls way way far out and, and a mm. lot, lot of movement. But down down twenty, there's there's obviously it wasn't working the the other way either. So they'll they'll break the game down and and they'll get into a, a sink and and figure that out. Well, I guess the other thing is um, you're not going to take Oliver off for too often when you're trying to come back. And also, Majuk Deng was having a, a terrific game, so maybe 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 that was a factor in why why he couldn't get in the, into the game either. Well, I didn't think Oliver had as a, a good a game as the as the first one. Um, he didn't, but he but he's always a threat, isn't he? Like he's always capable of absolutely of leading, leading a comeback. Yeah, absolutely. But the teams are kind of cluing into this the alley oop sort of plays. Yeah. Um, so they're really they're really pinching in on the defenders and and kind of uh, bumping Oliver rolling down or anticipating that alley oop. So there's there's always a few bodies now up above the rim in that sort of area where where the alley-oops were happening um, all the time last year. So teams have adjusted, and that's the thing. If you if you underestimate this league, think that the same team's going to roll in with the same punches, I, I think you'd, you'd probably be mistaken. But, you know, they the, this team, this type ends team will, you know, they're, they're four games in or uh, six if you include those those yep. two closed door preseason games. But it's still early days, and there's no, it's certainly no panic stations. It's it's just readjusting and recalibrating, and then finding your groove, and then moving on from there. Yeah, it really sets the stage for a huge weekend, though, doesn't it? Against two of the finalists from last year, we'll learn a lot more against the Kings and against Melbourne United this weekend. This episode of the Pikey and Lowes Show is proudly brought to you by Cairns Total Physio. Less pain, more life. And Staten's Plumbing Company. Plumbers who care. Now, Lowes, just quickly across the league, there was a few other games in round one as well. I'll read through the, through the results quickly and you can tell me if anything stood out about those games. So it started Friday night and Melbourne United blew... The Adelaide 36 is away in the second half and won 89 to 65. Then on Saturday we saw the Hawks start with a with a win 90 to 84 against the Brisbane Bullets. Then there was a double overtime game on on Sunday in Adelaide and it was the 36ers 116 beating the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix 108. And as we record this leading into the first game for the Taipans this weekend, we've had a couple of games already in round two. So Wednesday night. The Phoenix got some revenge over the 36ers, winning 89-83. to And on Thursday night, the Hawks, they're now 3-0. and They beat the Brisbane Bullets 90-82. to what, what jumps out about about those games? Well, one, Gorgian going 3-0 is and um, <laughs> mm. already proving to be a, a massive threat for this year. So he, he's got his guys just probably just junking it up. And switching and changing things up so much, uh, and then with a, a group that's bought in and a, you know athletic, they're they're causing some disruption early. I thought that double overtime game uh, with uh, 36ers and uh, Phoenix was was pretty awesome to watch. Mm. Uh, pretty on the edge of your seat stuff, and great to see uh, you know next star uh, Giddy play uh, some yeah. huge minutes uh, down that stretch. Uh, so that that was exciting. Um, but yeah, some some of the the, the big. Well, not so big surprises, but I guess shock is that you know Brisbane Bullets have gone down for quite a few, few games, and um, you know I don't think we we tipped them last week, sort of finishing very high. So um, mm. yeah, it's just it's just interesting to see who's who's going to adjust and actually you know fire up and improve themselves amongst all this the talking in the preseason. So um, yeah, your your thoughts on the teams that stood out the most? Yeah, I think sometimes it especially early in the season, it can come down to getting your imports right. And, and we obviously saw that so highlighted more than ever last year with the Taipans. So obviously Newbold, Machado and, and Oliver were so so outstanding. But 
to me, the Hawks have been brilliant because they've got their imports right. I know that Gorgians is a great coach, and, and he's a big factor in that, and they've got a, a lot of good pieces around them. But but for Justin Simon and Tyler Harvey, those two imports look to be spot on and, and two of the best imports in the league. And I look at a team like Adelaide, and they've virtually got nothing out of their two imports, Donald Sloan and Tony Crocker, over their first three games. And as a result, they're one and two, and, and that double overtime win, they were probably probably lucky, lucky to get. So to me, it really highlights how important your imports are are in this league and the Hawks have got them right and right now you would say Adelaide hasn't got theirs right and, and the Bullets who are also 0-2 and two, they probably haven't got as much out of their imports Vic Law and Orlando Johnson as they as they would have hoped either I wonder how I wonder how quickly um, you know the, the talks in clubland start going before an import is is kind of thought to be moved on mm. and it's usually I'd say usually six six games in or, or six sort of weeks in um, and then you you know there might be an airline ticket slipped across the desk at the mm-hmm. next meeting say hey look this is yours thanks for your time um, so yeah how quickly will teams pull the trigger can they afford the replacement can they you know can they actually afford to get this deal done or do they you know they lock down and, and show support and and um you know give give the the coach and the team their their un, undying trust and faith in them turning the turning mm-hmm. a corner but um i don't know the other factor right now is are you able to get another import in thanks to covid and all the restrictions is it is it actually possible to swap your imports? Yeah, well, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna plan to swap someone at the six game or six week mark, um, then you've got to get them in at the four weeks. You've got to sign them off at Probably the three week mark. So yeah. you're gonna have to do it now. <laughs> and yeah. Get them waiting in the uh, waiting in quarantine mm. uh, when you get back to when you get back home. So um, I think it's going to be uh, a pretty crazy kind of a, a year and it's hard to really gauge like you can say oh look they've, they've had three games on the road or they've well they've you know in, in these cases those those two they've teams been have home. been the, the yeah. home side so um, yeah I mean it's uh, you know the, the players must feel the sense of urgency for sure like you know as an individual they're like well I better perform otherwise I'm out I mean that that pressure is going to be coming mm. in there as well so um, so Played overseas in Europe, you know what that what it's like to be an import with that pressure on. What's it like having that pressure on, knowing that you have to perform every night, or else you might get fired if you have one or two bad well, games. You, you know, it's a team sport, but you also know that you're the most replaceable because there's there's yep. no other locals available uh, at the caliber. Uh, you know, they're all signed up. So, I mean, that's the nature of the beast. That's you know, you know that going in. So, you, if there's mm. anyone that's going to be replaced, it's the imports. So knowing that you know that it's, you just take it, you just take it, um, you know, uh, on the chin, and that's that's the, the the cross you have to bear, and so that that's you just get on with it. But it is funny that when it, when a loss does happen, you know, it'll be um, sometimes you get singled out, um, or, or the imports get singled out, um, and, and I remember in Spain they they were running laps or something like that, like it was some college kind of. Uh, regime and um, you know the imports had to run extra laps after a loss as <laughs> it was just a real defining thing as if you guys are the ones wow. to blame it's like well hang on a minute <laughs> you know everyone's in on this but yeah the coach was just trying to you know establish a, a point so yeah it's a it's a funny one but at the end of the day that the performance is um, you know crucial and that's what you get paid for so if you if you're not performing or if the team's not performing the only real change you can make is uh, the imports because there's a dime a dozen mm. sitting in the wings waiting um, that haven't quite made the NBA, that haven't, that don't want to go to Europe. So, yeah, there's options galore. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to follow. What we do know is that the Taipans imports aren't going anywhere. They're, they're locked in for, for the next two seasons, so we don't have to worry about it here here in Cairns. Now, that's that's been a big wrap-up of the opening weekend here on the Pikey and Laos show. Now this week, Laos, the Sydney Kings have been have been in town. They've been in Cairns, and they haven't been able to do a hell of a lot outside of their hotel room. So you were lucky enough to catch up with a, a former teammate of yours. He spent his f- first four NBL seasons as a teammate of yours at the Taipans. He went to the Brisbane Bullets for a couple of years, and then he found himself out of the league. And it's a great success story of perseverance that he was happy to just be training up in Cairns and waiting for an opportunity. He got a, a little bit of a chance in Adelaide at the end of that 2019 season. And then all of a sudden, a spot opened up at the Sydney Kings and he had the best season of his career last year. 
he's now locked and loaded as an important member of this Kings team. And and Sean Bruce is a is a hell of a basketball story. Yeah, it's an awesome story with Sean Bruce. But uh, I was able to catch him before they go into their mandatory three day quarantine before the game. But check out the Statins Plumbing Company interview of the week with Sean Bruce. Okay, excited about our guest for the podcast. Uh, he needs no introduction. Former Taipans fans will certainly know the name. He's a journeyman. He's been around the league. Uh, from my count, nine to ten different teams, different head coaches. Uh, and he's certainly got the tools of the trade to stay in the game and uh, exciting player and someone uh, he came into the Taipans as a, as a young buck and just proved himself all the way through. I'm talking about none other than Sean Bruce. Welcome, Sean Bruce. Lousy. Thanks, mate. What, a, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, you came up to the Taipans 2012. I reckon if we just hit up your journey so far, uh, 2012 to 2016, the Taipans, D, the DP for that first year, uh, and then contracted player for the for the three years after that. That was the that was the start of your professional career. What what were your thoughts um, coming in for that that period of time, and and what did you take out of that experience? Oh man, it was just a dream come true, really, at the time. Getting an opportunity, um, always just wanted to play here in Australia and play in the NBL and set that goal. So to be able to um, achieve it and start here in Cairns was really special, and obviously had a, a lot of great veterans to learn from. Um, Great imports to play against, and um, obviously Fernie taught me a lot during that period of time as well. Um, but yeah, had some really enjoyable memories. Obviously, going to the grand final and um, the season we had that year was a lot of fun, and still to this day, come back and have a good feeling about the place and a lot of great memories. What I remember about that, especially that first year, I think Trigger and I always commenting on it is is your work ethic for that year. Um, it was just like. It, it was it was totally different from uh, a lot of the other sort of young players that you know we'd seen come and go. Um, but this one was different. You you were just so committed and focused, and almost to a fault where you just looked exhausted sometimes. But we could see you just putting in the hard yards in that first year. Uh, were you exhausted after all the work that you were doing in uh, in 2012? Yeah, no, for sure. I had a pretty big, uh, I guess, schedule on the table. We had the academy going back then and then obviously type ends training, being the development player. But I mean, I just stepped in and thought that was what was needed to be done. And that's what was asked, asked of me. So I had to do it kind of thing. So had some long days, but a lot of fun and good to look back on. I think that certainly set up your work ethic. Um, following the Taipans, you know, two years at the Bullets, uh, there was a sprinkling of obviously the off-season uh, Marlins and Mackay Meteors, uh, but the Bullets was your was your next big stage uh, for the NBL. Uh, what, what was it like for that transition into um, you know our uh, at the Taipans, the, the the Queensland Derby? Yeah, I mean, obviously that was a big change for me at the time, um, moving clubs and going to a club that was just starting as well, um, coming back into the league. Again, had a lot of learning experiences from that. Um, yeah, and obviously with those games, had a lot of fun. Those those Queensland derbies were, I guess, a rivalry game that's being created. And yeah, had a lot of fun coming back, playing against Fernie and a lot of really close mates. And I think we split most of them games, which which wasn't, it was good and bad. I obviously loved the wins, but, but losing to your mates was tough. But no, nah, had a lot of fun and loved the, loved the competition. Just seeing of this always. Do you need to do you need to do some vacuuming? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, we'll get out of you. Hey, get out of your way. <laughs> okay, we just have to move out of our five hundred dollar an hour room in back into the lobby um, because the vacuum cleaner guy has come in. But that's all right. We'll uh, we'll switch it up to this. now. Off season, um, you know those those gaps sort of off season. So, Bruce, you, you played at the. The obviously Marlins and, and Meteors. I remember that season with the Mackay Meteors, an MVP uh, year for yourself. Um, gearing up for that grand final, obviously a, a big ankle injury leading up to that that NBL season, uh, which where I thought you were definitely ready to um, you know take take a lot of minutes on board. So the frustration of that injury. Talk me through how you handled it uh, from a professional standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I guess. To begin with, the frustration come from my first season down in Brisbane, I think. Didn't go the way I'd planned, moving clubs, and I um, think we finished bottom in the end that season, so that in itself had a pretty bit of taste in my mouth. So going into that off-season, obviously really motivated, um, 
wanted to be better that following year. And as you mentioned, had a pretty good year, um, but was unlucky. Got an injury in the last game and had to deal with that. I'd never really had a major injury before, and yeah, had to deal with that for the first time, which which wasn't easy, but. Um, Something that I was, I guess, lucky to learn a lot from, learn a lot more about my body. And I think going forward, I learned how necessary it is to take care of it and little things you can be doing to prepare in each week. I think that was a positive from that, that time period that I just really learned that your body is what's needed to really step forward and you really got to take care of it. So um, plenty to learn from. It was hard to deal with at the time, but kind of got over it now and... Um, been able to play some better basketball since then, but it was yeah a bit of a grind there for a year or so. Um, during that that grind, obviously you you're able to get over to the Wellington Saints, a, a massive club over in New Zealand, NBL. Um, you took it all the way to the, the minor premiers and unfortunately go down in the grand final by a couple. But after that, um, there was obviously a bit of a, a bit of a gap, and you're able to tr- to train with the Taipans, uh, even even do a short stint in, at the Malaysia Dragons where Jamie Perlman was at. Um, to trail off that 2018 season, join the Adelaide 36ers, how, how did you find that you're able to stay relevant even in a, in a, a frustrating year? What would you put that down to uh, and how do you think it, it helped the, the following years now at success at the Kings? Yeah, that year was a real funny one. Um, obviously, I didn't have a job to start the season and um, as most years go, you know, there's guys go down with injuries, um, replacement players are coming in and out but for whatever reason that year it just never came there was no injuries or nothing long term enough where a team was ready to replace someone so um, it ended up getting to six weeks to go in the season and Ramon went down in Adelaide and an opportunity come up and always knew I guess that opportunity was going to come at some stage and it was just about staying ready for it and I was really lucky at the time um, I returned here to Cairns where my partner is and um, Mike was really welcoming and let me train with you guys for, I think, five or six months and, and be a part of the program, which I'm extremely thankful for and something that I think if I didn't have, I'm not really sure what would have happened. I mean, staying in that day-to-day day grind and working out and having the team environment to be around was, was really helpful for me. And I guess on the flip side, hopefully, I, I was able to help Mike a little bit in times that, where they didn't have as many numbers. But... um. Yeah, I guess my, my mindset was just to stay ready for whatever come. Um, I knew I belonged in this league and knew I, um, I guess, just had to wait my time and have the right opportunity come. And originally that was in Adelaide, but then it led to, I guess, that off-season, then joining the Kings and, and joining a, a magnificent team and club that was, yeah, coached by Will Weaver that was incredible for me. So I was really thankful for that. So just that, I, I can just see that work ethic kind of carry you through a lot of this and, and the mindset, the confidence that you said you had, um, you know, it really, really kept you kind of in touch with, you know, a, a phone call away from, from sort of contract and training with us. I remember, um, training great. Like we were, I'm just looking around, uh, thinking like, how, how is this guy not, you know, with the team? Uh, so the skill set and, you know, what you brought, um, certainly was going to carry you through, you know, a, a, a small bump in the road. Um, so from, from Adelaide 36ers, obviously landing that role at the Kings, um, with a relatively unknown coach for the most of the public, but a well-known within the playing circles as an assistant coach for the Boomers, um, ties with all you know the the Boomers circles of that, and for him to come in the league, your relationship um, as a as the floor general, uh, I really felt sort of blossom and obviously you know exploded for 7.4 points a game uh, in that season, 3.4 assists, uh, a handy numbers for for someone sort of coming off the bench until Lish gets injured, and then you're able to start a lot of the games. Uh, talk to me about that, that success you've had last year. Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of these opportunities really come down to luck sometimes, I feel. Like, it, it began with Will, and he'd, he'd obviously built relationships with a lot of my former teammates being a part of the Boomers, and I was really just lucky those guys kind of vouched for me and, and put in a good word. And then, I guess, when I got into his system and, and playing for him, I think... The plan originally was for my role to be pretty limited, but um, as you know, injuries happen. Um, We had quite a few of them last year, and all of a sudden my role maybe went from maybe five minutes a game to 20, 25, which I think just comes down to luck and time and place sometime, which I'm really thankful for. 
Well, certainly a lot of the hard work that puts you in that position where you can capitalise on that uh, on that opportunity. So uh, it was no surprise for me uh, and a couple of my former teammates as well when we see you getting the, the go-ahead um, for a lot of those extra minutes and I thought you held it down awesomely. Um, obviously, the, the most frustrating off-season, longest off-season ever, the mindset coming out of it. Are you just excited to be able to play each game? Is that, is that, is that where the mindset's at, just take it day by day? Yeah, it really is. I think, I mean, it was nine months and we got two pre-season games in before Christmas and then didn't play again for three and a half weeks until last Saturday, obviously having our opener against the Taipan. So even going into that game, I guess my mindset was just, we've got this game scheduled at this point. We'll play that, see what happens. I think earlier or maybe it was late last week, it was like, okay, we're playing Cairns again round two. We don't know who's after that. Like, it really is just taking it day by day, but really that fortnight schedule, I guess, epitomises what this season's all about. And you just never know what's going to be thrown at you next. So um, definitely appreciate it just playing again and looking forward to hopefully um, being able to knock out a full season. Well, you're age 30 now, obviously, your ninth year in the league. Um, you've still got plenty more years to go. What, what are you most excited about as you evolve as a player? Uh, what are you excited about uh, for the future for Sean Bruce? Yeah, I mean, like most players, I just want to win. Um, come really close last year. Obviously, um, the circumstances of COVID and everything that happened with that season happened. But, um, yeah, I'm at the point now where I'm pretty happy with, I guess, the personal career I've had. I just really want to win and cap off everything I've done with some team success and, yeah, bringing a, bringing a championship to Sydney. Sean Bruce, thanks for your time and being on the podcast. On your last. Thanks, mate. Great to catch Sean Bruce and that interview of the week, proudly brought to you by Statton's Plumbing Company and uh, the big supporters of the Pikey and Lauer show. And we, we thank them for their support. But yeah, great great to be able to catch or, or Brucey and I uh, certainly look forward to how his uh, his game takes shape and evolves uh, as he embarks on the second half of his career. I'll say half because he's nine years in, mm. he's 30, he's certainly got uh, plenty more years left. I'm going to say at least another nine uh, before <laughs> wow. he gives uh, gives old Lauer a call and says, hey mate, where are the beers? Now, Lau's another special part of our show here on Talking Taipans, the Pikey and Lau show for this season. New development, thanks to Cairns Total Physio, we will have an MVP tracker throughout the season and we'll announce our Cairns Total Physio MVP come the end of the season. So as a result of that, thanks to Tom and Tim at Cairns Total Physio, they'll be casting their votes after each game of this NBL season. And we'll be keeping track of it here on the Pikey and Lau show. So after round one, the votes are in. And from the Saturday night game against the Sydney Kings, we've got three votes, Scott Machado, two votes, Cam Oliver, and one vote for Mirko Jarek. And then Monday night against the Hawks, we've got three votes, Cam Oliver, two votes for Kuat Noi, and one vote, for Majuk Deng. Thanks to Cairns Total Physio for their support, ongoing support here at the Pikey and Lau show. We're talking Taipans and we'll keep track of their votes for the MVP tracker throughout the season. Yeah, it was fascinating to watch that battle, wasn't it, when there was plenty of talk on the bench and it was a lot easier for Deng Adele to do a lot of the talking because he didn't have to suit up a play, so he could just sit there and, and talk all night while Majuk Deng was trying to get the job done on the court. He was he was getting stuck in out there every three. He was looking at him <laughs> and just saying, "There's another three. There's another three. And then uh, Adele on the bench would just be shaking his head and smiling like it was just it was just constant. <laughs> so uh, that was it was fun to see, and I'm sure you know they always have uh, their their rivalries. There's quite a few on a lot of South Sudanese on a lot of teams. So yeah, I'm sure maybe the, maybe there's rivalries for for Majuk Deng uh, throughout the whole league. So uh, it was certainly fun to watch. Now, Laos, let's get to our preview for oh, yes. the two big games for the Taipans <laughs> this weekend. Before I do, how did the pop-up arena stand up as an NBL venue for the for the two games that you went to? Oh, look, I thought it was well-received, packed house, uh, both games, and um, just good to see that there was a solution in play that um, really just allowed the game to, to continue mm. on in, in Cairns. So, yeah, big 
big ups for all that involved. Obviously, um, you know, member for Mulgrave, Curtis Pitt, huge instrumental play in um, really being the voice in uh, state government to be able to to make that all happen and Taipan's obviously pushing they were working their, their tails off all off season to to make this thing happen so you know the Cairns Convention Centre down but certainly a, a great result uh, to see the games live and um, be able to fill the stadium with the support of the Cairns locals so uh, certainly a positive at the snag pit for all these uh, games. Yeah absolutely it's, and as it turns out in this COVID world it, if you're going to have one season where you don't have a full capacity stadium at the convention centre and you have to go down in size. This is the time to do it. So in a funny way, it's actually turned out, you know, quite okay timing-wise. So, And I've got players in Spain that are saying, what the heck is that, <laughs> Laos? Because I posted a pic that's, you know, which showed yep. how many people were in the, the stands. And he's like, how is that even possible? Because he said that in, in Spain, it's messed up. They can't, you know, the, the season's yep. cancelled and they can't even, they're not even close to coming back into play. So he was just amazed that, P1, people could fill the stadium and the, the, the league was still going ahead. But, um, you know, every seat they could be, you know, uh, side by side and not have to be spaced. And, you know, it's just um, it's just very, very privileged that the game is still able to be played in Australia because in Europe they're really yeah. struggling, which means the players aren't, you know, playing and they're, they're struggling as well. So uh, he just wished, said, oh, I, I wish the, um, Spain could get their, their business sorted um, you know, COVID sort of style and get the regulations and everyone buy in, but it's not going to happen because it's just out of control. But, mm. you know, very lucky to have the games here. And I'm sure yep. if people sort of realise what's going on in Europe, um, it's, you know, they would see that it's a privilege to be able to even have the games. So um, huge ups for, you know, Australia to, to be Absolutely. able to make that happen and for the league to go th- jump through all those hoops and make a safe, safe way to have the game still played. Yeah, I think we all should feel very lucky to be living where we are right now in one of the very few places in the whole world where where we're not really that affected by by COVID and we've kept it under control. So so we're, we're very privileged to be where we are. Now, Saturday night, it's up against the Sydney Kings once again. So, Laos, do the Taipans bounce back from that, you know, pretty disappointing performance against the Hawks or do the Kings get to make up for a game that they probably felt on Saturday night last week that they... They let slip. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think the Kings are going to be looking at uh, some of the things that work really well. Um, they're certainly going to be making the adjustments. Um, Taipans have had less time to lick their wounds, but are they more motivated now after that loss uh, to the Hawks? I don't think the Taipans play well at all. With a with a twenty point loss, it's certainly not one to you know write home about. So they they've really. I hope this is a wake up call for the the Taipans and they can go right. This are we serious here? Are we for real in this league? Um, or are we just going to roll out expectations from last year's team? So they've got to really grab it by the horns, be on the front foot, and just be frisky for a lot better defense, a lot better communication. Um, so I'd I'd like to think that. The motivations there and the, the players that can fire up are going to be getting this squad rolling and um, certainly learning from a lot of those uh, sort of defensive errors and, and fixing that communication gap that seems to be uh, sort of happening from that last game. So Taipans versus Kings, oh, it's going to be tricky. I think it's going to be a lot closer than we mm. anticipated that the first time around. Um, I, I will go Taipans by four, uh, but I think the, the Kings are certainly going to be uh, a, a tough matchup. Your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'll stick with the Taipans as well, but I think we're going to learn a lot because this season was always going to be a lot tougher in a lot of ways than last year because all of a sudden, last year they were able to play with a chip on their shoulders but have no expectations. Now all of a sudden... There's expectations on their back. Everybody has to come back and improve on what they did last year because all of a sudden everyone is throwing everything at playing the Taipans because everyone's talking about how how exciting the Taipans are. So they need to deal with those expectations and they can't afford complacency, which might have been a problem in at times during those first two games where they might have felt because of their reputations that it would just happen for them. You can't afford to be like that. So I'm fascinated to see how Saturday night goes because that might lead into how Monday night goes because it's a big ask against a Melbourne United team that will be now now fresh. They opened their season on last Friday night in Adelaide and then they got to go home. So for the first time in three weeks, they spent a few days back home in Melbourne and then they came back up to Cairns to get ready for the game on, on Monday night. And they not only are they fresh, they're coming off a 24-point a win and they're full of stars and they come into the season as the championship favourites. So 
it's a fascinating game again on Monday night too. There's no, there's no time to waste here. There's no time to waste here. This is eight precious home games on your home floor. This is the time. Well, I feel like there's a bit of slumber there that haven't woken up from their off-season slumber yet. And they need to wake up to be able to go, are we for real? Do we want this? Because a win against the Kings will then catapult that confidence, that momentum that they'll need against Melbourne United, who are you know tipped to win that game. So you know they're going to need it, and this weekend's going to be, like you said, very telling on how you know whether they find themselves in the middle of the pack once they go into that bubble, or are they going to use this moment in time to to really elevate and actually. Um, you know, really bond together because the game, that last game was was not in, enjoyable at all to see how it unfolded. Mm. And uh, certainly the 20 point loss to Melbourne United in the preseason wasn't enjoyable as well. And I think that came as a shock to them that, that first time around. So, um, you know, the, this is a very important, huge weekend in terms of Taipans proving who they are in this league. Are they for real? Are they going to show up and deliver what they know that they can do? And I think I think we'll be able to see uh, which direction uh, that they'll be heading after this weekend. Yeah, well said. I, I can't add much more to that, Lars. You've covered it nicely. One thing I do want to ask you, though, if on Sunday in Perth we're able to get Sean Reddidge and Damien Martin both on the TV coverage at the same time, for the games in Cairns, why can't we have Alex Loudon and Cam Trigard together? Uh, I don't... I don't, I don't know what the hub um, is. Are you saying they're still going to have the hub commentating the game in Perth? Yeah, and they're going to have both both of those guys in Perth. So yeah. why can't we have you two up in Cairns? Uh, well, there's different rules on court. There's different rules. Like our mascot can't <laughs> even get on the get on the court. So I mean, I'd love to be a part of it, obviously. So down the track or whatever, I'm always open, and it was enjoyable and. You know, we'll, we'll give it a good crack for NBL one if uh, if Money Mike at, at Cairns Basketball doesn't have other ideas. But I think mm. my playing days are, are long gone, and I don't mind the the, the job behind the desk or, or a microphone. So maybe I'll cut my teeth on NBL one stuff. But um, no, certainly certainly will be fun down the track if it was ever to eventuate. I'll keep pushing your case forward, Lars. Don't worry. Um, good on you, mate. Now, did you just break some news? Have you announced your NBL one retirement before it's actually actually started? No, 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 no. Retract that one. Retract that one. I didn't say anything. Let's let's move on to the games. Let's move on to the games. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been a big show, Lars. I enjoyed your chat with Sean Bruce, and I've enjoyed all of your insights into the games last weekend and now your thoughts for the Taipans to play the Kings on Saturday night and Melbourne United on Monday night. I can't wait to see how it all unfolds and to come back and to dissect it all again next week. We'll have another special guest here on the Pikey and Lau show as well. So I'm Chris Pike, and I'll, I'll sign off on Talking Taipans this weekend. And leave you with Alex Loughton. Taipans by four against the Kings. It's going to be Taipans by one point in an overtime win against Melbourne United. Lock in. Taipans are starting to load up and they're going to prove it this weekend. Let's go support uh, the, the club, support the Snakes, uh, and we'll see you at the Snake Pit. 